Excellent. Well, we can see something sharing now. And then, well, thank you very much. If you'd like to uh, tell us a bit more about automating that from my cost feed, we're looking forward to hearing about it. Yep. Uh, many thanks for the opportunity to present today. My name is Daniel Boyko. I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University. And I would like to describe the work I was doing and do, doing now as well with uh, Valentine and Annika on automated the Chrome across previous deep learning. Also, we will cover other interesting objects and uh, uh, hopefully it will be interesting. So uh, uh, today, what we'll start with is what, what is machine learning? We will see different applications and a good framework to see uh, how can we think about machine learning systems. Uh, then we will uh, see how machine learning can be applied to study the chrome microscopy data. And finally, we see how machine learning can be used for complementary methods such as spectrometry. So what is machine learning? Uh, you probably already seen many, uh, many great successes in uh, science uh, done using machine learning, uh, including uh, AlphaFold, uh, which did uh, spatial structure prediction of protein from amino acid uh, sequence. It is molecular transformer to predict chemical reactions. It is discovering matrix multiplication algorithms or deciphering uh, Asian text. And when we think about machine learning, we, we usually start with data. And in the case of supervised learning, we have some uh, features which describe our data, which is our X and our targets, which are our Y. And what we want to do, we want to uh, make some model that can take features and produce targets. And of course, we need to measure how well are we doing and uh, how similar our predictions to targets we want to predict. And for that, we need a function to optimize. So for example, uh, for regression, it just means squared error loss. We just subtract them, take squares, and sum them up. And uh, we have model, we have some parameters, numbers, uh, for example, weights and linear regression. Uh, but then we need uh, some algorithm to perform this optimization. And it may be different. For example, for neural network, we use uh, neural networks, we usually use gradient descent methods and some variations on top of that. So uh, we all know that electron microscopy is a very important method. It can be used in material science, catalysis, biology, uh, give us very nice pictures, which are usually pretty easy to interpret. Uh, and uh, we think that uh, the phone work is about scanning electron microscopy. So uh, machine learning can improve results of uh, electron microscopy data collection, collection and processing pipeline. So usually we start with sample preparation. And you could imagine using robotic platforms uh, to reduce costs, uh, reduce error rate, uh, some quality control systems, or even generate experimental protocol uh, to perform experiments uh, in a way in which you get better results. Uh, data acquisition, which includes uh, automated recording, and uh, there are many sub-problems such as autofocus, surface map, and intelligent exploration of the surface. Uh, this can be also done to improve reducibility and reduce manual work time. Uh, data processing includes uh, denoising and refocusing if we did mistake, uh, uh, focusing in the wrong way. And finally, data analysis. And this is the most uh, application rich area, we can solve various computer vision tasks, we can do detection segmentation, uh, various uh, methods for uh, analyzing data we get. And I will start with the last step in the pipeline. So what types of data analysis tasks can we solve? Uh, the simplest one is just search for individual objects. For example, you may search for nanoparticles, or if you're doing uh, related to biology research, you may search for bacteria or something else. Also, uh, sometimes we get multiple order, uh, multiple objects, and their uh, patterns of the, their positions define the sample. And we can get information about the sample as a whole, just getting uh, information about these patterns. And finally, we can analyze data in time domain. So this form sort of three dimensions data analysis. We'll start with the simplest one. Um, previously in uh, our group uh, was proposed a concept of totally defined nanocatalysis. And it comes from very simple observations. And when we think about homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysts, one of the big differences is that homogeneous catalysts are usually well-defined. So uh, 
For example, we put some metal complex into the reaction mixture and we know what we're putting in there. We can take NMR, single crystal X-ray, uh, various spectroscopy methods, and we know what we're putting there. Of course, we don't know what will happen next. There may be very uh, fast changes and you may see the composition, formation of plant particles, uh, various processes, but at least you know what you're putting in there. In case of heterogeneous catalysis, you can take uh, some amount of palladium and carbon catalyst, and you don't know what actually you're putting in there. You may get nanoparticles, metal clusters, uh, single atoms. Uh, you usually don't know distribution of uh, nanoparticle sizes. And the concept proposes very simple idea. That let's just take very small uh, particle of support with uh, corresponding nanoparticles, and then analyze it. And of course, data sets will be huge. And manual analysis is impossible. And what we can do, we could train neural network models to make these predictions. And uh, also for some particles, uh, it worked pretty well. For some, we didn't have enough data for uh, for covering uh, uh, nanoparticles and good enough quantification. So we came up with a two-step approach. The first step, we recorded a support particle at lower magnification pass through neural network, get area of this particle, and then we get uh, uh, many images at higher magnification, pass them through neural networks, get uh, uh, number of nanoparticles and their sizes, and then aggregate the statistics. And this data was used to calculate Chernobyl numbers, and it turned out that they were very good. And uh, prediction of individual, uh, if you want to predict uh, what is the area of uh, support particle, everything's quite easy. But when you want to predict uh, individual nanoparticles, you have some sort of surprise. And this is done invisibly. What is called detection via segmentation. We take source image, we pass it to the neural network, get a map where we have, you know, in this pixel you get nanoparticle, and in this uh, pixel you have support. And then perform combination of uh, distance transform and watershed algorithm to find specific nanoparticles. And then you can do various types of analysis, uh, aggregate data, see distribution over sizes, uh, define various interesting metrics, uh, uh, such as circularity of uh, these particles. We also had a collaboration with uh, Tool State University, uh, where we were thinking whether we can develop a classical computer vision uh, method that will be faster and help us solve the task better. And the work started with proposing new evaluation approach for that, uh, because defining accuracy in such problems is uh, pretty hard. And uh, it was solved. And then we compared various classical computer vision methods and developed a new method, which is exponential approximation. Uh, and it worked better than neural networks. So uh, uh, there are always ways to make it better and faster. Uh, the next dimension is the analysis of patterns and object ordering. And uh, uh, this project, it comes from a very interesting observation that if you perform standard procedure for depositing palladium nanoparticles on carbon support, uh, you may get very different pictures. So for some types of carbon support, uh, you may get very nice, uh, interesting patterns. Uh, uh, but for others, you get very random positions of palladium nanoparticles. Uh, and, uh, it's clear that it's caused by the facts on uh, this carbon material surface. And we analyzed processes that may happen there. We used uh, quantum chemistry calculations to aggregate this data, confirm that uh, what we get, uh, what picture we get matches what we see from a uh, point of view of difference in energy between pristine surface and defect area. Uh, and uh, if we just spend some time looking at the um, the, the different images, uh, you may notice uh, distinct patterns. So for example, if you have a graphene layer and you'll see uh, on the side many nanoparticles, you may see grain boundaries. Uh, if you have uh, uh, bending sheets somewhere, you will get uh, different positions of nanoparticles there. And also some interesting objects such as circles. And uh, to do for the analysis, we collected a data set of found images, and uh, we analyzed how this data changes on three level of structural organization, uh, and it was publicly released. Uh, it was mostly made to frame our own research, but it turned out uh, uh, 
it is very helpful. There are other groups that use this data set. And we started with a very simple problem. Uh, so we know that some materials uh, show ordered behavior and some materials not. And uh, how can we actually predict this degree of order? And uh, it was a very long problem before because uh, we were publishing papers and saying that we have ordered positions of particles and reviewers usually ask, uh, how do you know what is the degree of order? And the simplest approach here is just take input image, determine non particle positions, uh, and then perform some statistical tests to confirm whether you have uniform distribution or not. Uh, but in reality, this approach fails because uh, even though you may have uh, uh, some uh, random distribution of non particles, uh, density of their positions may change. And it may be just from a geometric point of view, if you just rotate it uh, towards mm -hmm. the frame. Uh, you might get uh, different density. And uh, uh, another approach is very simple. You just ask whether it or not and train a model to do that. And uh, it results in very stable predictions, but uh, obviously have some interpretability issues. Uh, so to do this work, we train a neural network to perform classification. It's just encoder, hidden representation, and then uh, classifiers that determines whether we have ordered positions or not. And uh, it was trained with cross entropy loss. Uh, it worked very well, uh, better than uh, results of asking uh, some uh, random students uh, to label each of the images. So on, on this particular task, it performed better. And uh, uh, as this thing is fully differentiable, we can take the risk of, uh, of the input image uh, with respect to the output labels. And, Doing so, we may get maps where we'll see what parts of the image result in higher activation in the neural network. And uh, as we have some hidden representations, these are just vectors, we can analyze them as well. And uh, learning from scratch, the model was able even to differentiate between different samples, not only ordered or disordered positions of non particles. And as was described previously, uh, there are different type of effects. And we can just label these images. Uh, uh, I think it was around 10 images, so not so much. Train a model to do segmentation. And we were able to extract data about uh, separate uh, patterns observed here. Uh, and uh, the third dimension is analysis in time domain. And uh, this usually comes from uh, real-time electron microscopy. Uh, it's pretty complex to perform experimentally and data is usually very noisy and it's hard to analyze. And in this particular project, there was some analysis of temperature dynamics of ionic liquid water mixtures. Uh, and the system performed very fast changes. And uh, you can see on some frames that uh, uh, some cavities collapse and uh, some uh, encounters they expand. And uh, each video contains around 5,000 frames. And it's impossible to analyze manually. Of course, you can take every 10 frame, but it's still a lot. And uh, moreover, you, you don't just have to label them. You have to think about what cavity in what frame uh, uh, aligns with uh, each other. Uh, and uh, we did that using segmentation neural networks. Uh, and uh, it's just the same approach as we train a model, uh, uh, perform distant transform, uh, then use watershed algorithm to find them. Uh, and then we can perform uh, tracking of this individual uh, cavities. So uh, after a previous step, you just get positions of cavity in each frame. And uh, as you can see this on plot A, this uh, thin lines, they correspond to different trajectories, but it's just not, it's not enough just to find uh, for each cavity on the next frame, uh, uh, nearest neighbor from the previous, because changes may be very fast. And what we used is a combination of common filter, filter and Hungarian algorithm to, to perform this analysis. Uh, and we got some data, it was aggregated and uh, chemically meaningful conclusions were driven from that. Uh, also, it's you don't, if you want to perform some analysis in time domain, you don't have to use uh, 
uh, real-time electron microscopy, usually it's uh, enough just to collect multiple samples. And in another project, what we're doing, we collect images of the same area of the sample before and after resurrection. And then we perform alignment and do these predictions, and then we can see whether we have changes in the size of uh, nanoparticles or their positions. The next step is uh, data processing. And we have collaboration with the uh, Mochikask Polytechnic Institute where they were doing a very similar project to what was described previously with uh, ionic liquid water mixtures. And uh, what we find out that if we do a neural network denoising first, it improves results uh, a lot. And it was done in a very interesting manner that you uh, take small fragment of image, you mask pixel in the center and try to predict its value based on all surrounding pixels. And as you can see, a full pipeline with a neural network based denoising step uh, shows uh, better results. Finally, we can do some automation for data acquisition. And one of the ongoing projects is inspired by a very simple observation that uh, usually when we think about uh, Google Maps, for example, we can zoom out and see uh, different types of uh, texture corresponding to different types of the areas of Earth. Uh, for example, water, land, mountains, ice. And then when you zoom in, you start seeing new objects, roads, uh, uh, field, crop fields, uh, forests. Uh, and th this representation has some hierarchy in there. And for some samples we were used, we observed very similar things. And uh, if you want to characterize sample completely, uh, we can just uh, perform analysis on lower magnification, then uh, uh, use any approach for proposing new regions, and then increase magnification and analyze this region separately. Uh, uh, for the problem of uh, just an analyzing everything we may get, uh, we can do clustering-based approach by separating an image into small tiles, passing them through neural networks, collecting corresponding vectors, and performing uh, uh, clustering of these vectors. And uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, you see this area, which is obviously something different. You see a pretty uniform pattern here, a uh, pretty uniform pattern here. And uh, when doing clustering, uh, they correspond to different clusters. And for example, if you want to analyze orange area, you don't have to analyze it completely because you know how it looks like. So just increase magnification and sample some areas of the sample. And uh, another approach is this visual appearance. For example, uh, you could just search for something interesting, or if you're doing some quality control, you may collect images of the facts at lower magnifications, and then just train a model uh, to propose these regions for further analysis. We don't do anything for sample preparation, fortunately, but it would be, would be nice to see research in this area. And uh, usually systems we study is very, very dynamic, and we get uh, many reactions happening in solutions. And when I think about uh, very diverse chemistry and solutions, we usually think about mass spectrometry. And uh, this was a project on buckle factor reaction, and uh, two types of catalysts were studied here, mononuclear and uh, dinuclear catalysts. And uh, uh, it turned out if you just collect mass spectra of uh, individual catalysts, uh, uh, reaction mixtures right after mixing and then reaction mixtures after some time, uh, you can analyze this, uh, you can represent this mass spectra as vectors and can analyze them just for similarity without thinking individual about individual compounds. So for example, as you can see uh, here for uh, initial complexes, uh, complex B and C, these are the nuclear uh, complexes with different bridge ligand. Uh, they are similar to each other, but not similar uh, to the uh, mononuclear complex. But then when you mix everything, it starts to be very similar to each other and very similar to the mononuclear complex. And then when the reaction goes, uh, uh, bigger changes are observed and uh, it's not similar to what you had before. Uh, but if you think about such complex mixtures, another uh, very good method from mass spectrometry appears. 
this FTI CRMS provides unique opportunities for studying complex mixtures, uh, ultra high resolution, and uh, you may get information about uh, hundreds and thousands of compounds in the same time in the same reaction mixture. And usually it's hard to analyze this data because uh, uh, you have to analyze many peaks, many isotopic distributions. Uh, if you collect a large number of spectra, you need to increase uh, speed of analysis. And uh, also, uh, sphere packages we have now, they usually have very limited opportunities for data visualization. And when we think about how we analyze this data, we usually think about three levels. So each just level of entire spectrum, as was shown before, is the level of search for individual compounds and the search for every single compound in the spectrum and, and uh, analysis of it. And it's the best application for FTI-CRMS. Uh, one of the interesting features of FTI-CR FTI data is that you usually uh, can observe fine isotopic structure and corresponds to the fact that, for example, mass difference between carbon-13 and carbon-12 and uh, nitrogen-15 and nitrogen-14, they are not equal. And uh, usually uh, on mass spectrometers, you cannot observe this difference, but uh, in case of TI-CRMS data, you can see it. And there are some rule-based approaches for uh, determination of molecular formulas from this data, but uh, it usually covers very small set of elements, uh, uh, primarily CHO uh, and S. Uh, and uh, now people usually just uh, reduce search space by saying that, you know, I put this uh, reagent into this reaction mixture, I expect to see it, and uh, then perform in brute force for molecular formula. One of you propose that we will train neural networks to perform prediction of molecular formula and reduce search space, and then some uh, fine search will be done also with brute force, but it will be way faster. And the first step is just to isolate uh, separate isotopic distributions. And in case of high resolution data, uh, it is a big problem by itself. And we train the separate models to do that. And then when isotopic distributions were collected, we analyzed the scene of each aggregated isotopic variant as a vector passed through the current neural network uh, and got predictions for uh, element composition. And if you train this model, uh, you may see that it works very well for most of the elements except for monoisotopic elements, which is not surprising because they don't show up uh, on fine isotopic structure. And uh, data on the left is a synthetic data set and data on the right, just one of the complexes. And uh, uh, it gives some false positives for phosphorus and fluorine, but phosphorus and fluorine are monoisotopic elements, so it's not surprising. Also, you can perform regression for number of elements, and for some elements, it works very well for, you know, for carbon, uh, and this data can be used to reduce search space as well. Uh, also, one of the interesting features of that is that uh, these models, uh, even if they don't use information about mass, just the vicinity of each aggregate isotopic variant, they can perform very well. Uh, and for example, if you want to analyze some uh, reaction mixtures, you can take Sengashiro re reaction, uh, uh, perform uh, FTA CRMS measurements, uh, collect mass spectra, convert them into better form, and then search for isotopic distributions, and then you get elements for each isotopic distribution. Uh, and you can do various things. For example, you can take spectra and label all ions that contain palladium, and then you can aggregate it. For example, you can do mass spectrometry monitoring and then see how number palladium complexes changes over time. Uh, and you can perform more in-depth analysis. For example, search for all ions that contain chlorine and palladium. So here are the key takeaways. Uh, machine learning can be used to improve each step of uh, electron microscopy data collection and analysis pipeline. Uh, many machine learning methods uh, do not require larger data sets, and there were examples where we use only 10 labeled images. Of course, it requires some, uh, some uh, changes to the code to make it work better, but uh, you don't need 1,000 images to do that. Uh, you, 
can perform analysis of uh, uh, large data sets. It will probably result in more in-depth analysis and better conclusions. And finally, complementary methods such as mass spectrometry also benefit from the use of machine learning algorithms. Uh, thank you for your attention. I will be happy to answer questions. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Maybe I'll start then using Chairman's prerogative. Uh, Daniel, you, you mentioned at the end about the value of having a large volume of data but improving resolution. Is this more powerful for something like the mass spectrometry or, or the image data processing, the electron microscopy? When do you think having more data is more useful? Uh, so uh, when you think about the images, it's better to collect more data. And uh, But the main problem here is that when we perform, for example, segmentation, when we want to search for uh, uh, for the facts, it's, it takes four or five hours to label one image. One, one image. So, uh, uh, it's uh, very hard. For um, mass spectrometry, if you want to analyze samples completely, you just need many samples. And uh, if you want an analysis at the sample level, you don't need resolution. You can go with uh, uh, sample methods and probably uh, just full scan in a single quadruple instrument uh, will work. But uh, when we're searching for specific ions, uh, uh, we need higher resolution. And uh, uh, when we do, do NFT CRMS experiments, we saw that in many cases where we saw just one single metal complex in uh, uh, just a CRMS queue of data, we now see two or three of them in the same place. So uh, resolution helps, but only if you needed to search for something specific and analyze some, something specific. Thank you. Any more questions? I'll ask another one then. So you sort of showed that you could do you could carry out the noises, and you also showed that you could look at the flaming catalysts before and after reactions and sort of see if something's happened to the flaming. But with those two elements together, is it possible to actually look at real time? Imaging of flaming particles to sort of see if they evolve under the actual conditions. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's a good question. We, we, don't, we don't do it now for cases when we have uh, 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 when we have palladium uh, nanoparticles in the solution. You can perform uh, liquid phase uh, electron microscopy, uh, but uh, uh, when you're doing uh, when we're thinking about just uh, palladium and carbon catalysts, maybe harder. We don't do it now, but it, uh, uh, if it was possible, it would be very nice to see uh, this data and uh, draw some conclusions from that. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would have thought this strength of the machine learning that you could take some noisy data so it would sit you. And then apply the machine learning, particularly the denoising element, to really look at something happening on, on in real time. And I think the other good thing is that you're not just focusing on one nanoparticle. You could look at quite a few nanoparticles. So uh, you have a more statistical significance, let's say, in your observation. Oh, uh, it's true. Uh, uh, it's true, but uh, the main problem is that. Uh, so we, for example, what we could do, we could uh, uh, create synthetic data set of positions of nanoparticles, and then just uh, 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 synthetically reduce uh, uh, quality of images, uh, add noise, and then use uh, images to predict uh, images with uh, high, uh, with uh, higher uh, uh, with, with with lower noise, uh, but uh, it's it's a little bit hard scientifically because uh, then people may say that you have neural network which just imagines 
uh, nanoparticles, for example, they haven't ever existed before. So uh, there is a some trade-off between uh, uh, learning complex models uh, to improve quality of predictions and uh, uh, still the scientific as uh, aspect of uh, describing what we actually see. Okay, thank you very much. Can we just take this opportunity to thank Vanilla again? Thank you.